Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Wayne, for that introduction. Um, as Wayne mentioned, Nick and I are here to talk about dealing with a small business restructuring practitioner. Quite a mouthful for that time, this time in the afternoon. Um, I'm going to be leaving the bulk of the presentation to Nick today. You'll only be hearing from me for a short time because uh, he's very well equipped to be talking to you. Anyway, we're here to talk to you this afternoon about the small business restructuring practitioner. Um, before I get started, I just want to make sure everybody is familiar with what we're talking about. Has anyone had any experience with a small business restructuring practitioner? No? A couple? I know you both have down the back. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, hopefully by the end of this, once we get through the theory and then the practical content, uh, you'll be well versed and you'll know what to do um, next time you receive one of these notices because I'm sure as Patrick may allude to later, we're certainly seeing a rise on this type of activity and we're bound to see a bit more of a rise moving forward. So firstly, um, what we're going to be looking at is the context. How did we get here? And explaining what a small business uh, restructuring practitioner is. We're going to look at the process and run through, like I said, the theory and the eligibility around um, when businesses can look to apply for this particular process. Um, and then we're really going to get into the juicy part, um, which is when Nick's going to step up and we're going to talk about some strategies and what you need to be doing um, when these uh, types of notices are provided and when your, your customers are looking at putting themselves through this regime. So I'll get started. Um, before I move through, though, you'll notice a QR code at the top of the screen. Now, we're being a bit tech savvy today. If you want to scan the QR code, um, there's actually an ability to ask questions as we go throughout. Um, and we've got some, if you're online and you've got some questions coming in from home, those of you watching from the comfort of your, your couch, um, scan the QR code and we can look at the questions either throughout if they sort of fit where we're at or Nick and I'll handle the questions um, at the end. And then there will be more QR codes to scan at the end if you want a copy of the slides and if you would like to give some feedback. So moving forward with the times. All right. So. As I mentioned, um, we're here to take today to talk about the small business restructuring. Uh, it's important, I guess, uh, understand sort of how this came about and the context of what we're talking about. So it came about due to COVID, um, but it was an amendment that was made to the Corporations Act and it was formalised in June 2021. Prior to the small business restructuring um, and this wonderful piece of legislation that came into play sort of in the midst of COVID and got everybody a bit, bit concerned, there was a lot of criticism around this piece of legis legislation when it first came out in its draft format. Um, it put forward a change to the um, traditional regime with respect to external administration. So on the screen, what you'll see firstly, your external um, administration is traditionally your receivership, your voluntary administration, your liquidation and your deed of company arrangements. Um, and through the amendments that came into play, we saw um, two other options which we're going to work through um, this afternoon. I'm sure many of you have had um, experience with uh, li your liquid liquidations, your voluntary administrations, probably a few dockers and maybe even some receiverships. Um, but as I said, in June 2021, uh, we had some amendments that came into play and came through this act, this piece of legislation, um, the Corporations Amendment Corporate Insolvency Reforms Act. And what it brought about was small business restructuring and a simplified liquidation process. And as I said at the time, there was a lot of talk about this legislation. It was held as the most significant changes to insolvency law in the last 30 years. Um, the first draft that came through was a nightmare um, to get through. Um, I personally had written some submissions on it. But anyway, we ended up with this piece of legislation and essentially um, it brought through this new process. And what we're going to talk about today is small business restructuring, um, which is essentially a debtor in possession model where there's an appointment of a restructuring practitioner who assists the director um, to deal with a business that's in distress, but they still maintain control of that business and they look to restructure the existing debts um, that are sitting there. The other part of the legislation sits around the simplified liquidation process. Um, which, practically speaking, we're not seeing a lot of um, at this point in time. Um, speaking to a couple of insolvency practitioners, it's not something that they um, will often take up. There's some um, cost outweighing benefit type process to that. So we haven't seen a huge side um, or a huge example of this process being rolled out and actually working. But it's quite interesting when we uh, look at the numbers to what we've seen with respect to the small business restructuring. Um, in the last three months, we've seen 50% of the numbers with respect to those applying to go through this process actually occurring the last three months. So while it's been going for a year and a half, 
um, in the last uh, six sort of periods. We've actually seen in the last three months um, over 50% of um, businesses looking to take up the process and out of that 50% of the plans actually proceeding forward. So um, I think it's interesting to note those numbers because we're hearing a lot of um, the increase in liquidations, whether it's an increase or a normalisation depending on where you sit. Um, and obviously we've seen voluntary administrations continue on steady. But now we're starting to see the small business restructuring processes being used um, and various plans being put up. So it's important that um, as creditors, we understand firstly the process, we understand what to do if our customer is looking to um, move through this process and we understand what uh, rights we have. Um, there's probably a few reasons why we're seeing that. Again, I'm sure Patrick will talk to this, um, but you know we're seeing a lot of ATO activity, which we haven't seen. We've generally seen creditors moving forward with liquidations, obviously um, the fallout with respect to the DPNs and things that have been issued. But um, yeah, moving forward, I think it's something that we need to um, be across and, and be aware of. And that's where Nick's gonna come into play and give you all the strategies on how to work around that um, actually on the day to day. So for your customers to be looking at this process, there's an eligibility that needs to sit around it. Um, firstly, there needs to be less than $1 million in liabilities. Um, and the company must not have been under a restructuring or a simplified liquidation process within the preceding seven years. So safe to say at the moment, hopefully <laughs> your particular customers haven't looking at the numbers, but you never know moving forward. Um, and that the directors of the company, including the former directors within the past 12 months, must not have been previously utilising the process within the preceding seven years unless there's an exemption that applies. So there is that eligibility piece uh, that sits around it for a company to even look at taking up uh, this process. And in addition to that, um, this is sort of one that's quite interesting and has had a lot of um, feedback, I suppose, a lot of commentary around it is, Prior to the company being able to put up the restructuring plan, um, they must have paid out all their entitlements for their employees um, and they must have given all their returns and their notices and their statements and things through to the ATO. So I guess um, it can be a bit limiting when we're looking at the businesses of those um, sizes because often that's where those types of businesses fall down. They haven't always got their house in order. Um, so to even be able to qualify for this process, they need to have paid out the entitlements and then got their house in order um, with respect with respect to the ATO. So once they're over all those hurdles, well, they'll then look to appoint a small business restructuring practitioner um, who is uh, and must be a registered liquidator um, with ASIC, again, this was something that was um, up for quite discussion when um, the draft legislation per first came into play as to who can actually be this particular practitioner. And again, as we're seeing with the simplified liquidations um, with the small business side of thing, there are a few um, insolvency practitioners that are sort of marketing themselves out there as to, you know, I guess championing this type of process. And there are a few that aren't looking at it at all and um, just haven't sort of got into it. So um, they must be a registered uh, liquidator um, and their role is to assist and to determine whether essentially the company is eligible for restructuring. And then they get in and they help the director or directors put together that plan um, and assist with you know, working out which way they're gonna restructure the debts and what they're gonna do and, and how it all sits. Um, so they put together the plan and then it's put forward um, to the creditors and then it's up, up for discussion. So um, it's, I think, important to really um, understand that it isn't like your typical liquidation or your, um, your, your traditional external administration position where it will be that the liquidator or the administrator will be liable um, and that they'll take control of the company. The director still will at all times have control, um, just that the practitioner is there to, I guess, help restructure and guide um, that director through the distress, the financial distress that's um, occurring. So the other point that's worth mentioning is the types of creditors um, and when we're looking at who's actually affected by these particular plans and looking at you know, the impact it has on unsecured or secured um, creditors and you know, understanding, I suppose, the, the role um, with respect to a distinction between the two types to make sure that we don't have a scenario where we might have a director who's causing a detriment to creditors um, by you know, taking out a significant loan account, those types of things. So um, making sure that um, also we understand with, um, with respect to secured creditors that the secured creditors are only affected as to the extent that their debt is unsecured. 
um, and that they consent to the plan um, and also by court order. So um, depending on whether you're sitting in the position of a secured or unsecured creditor, there's different considerations um, that you need to be uh, aware of. And again, we'll look at all of that when we move through to the, the practical side of things. Um, lastly, from a theoretical perspective, um, once there has been obviously the plan um, put up or we've entered into this small business restructuring process, it's important to understand that um, that the impact this has on us as creditors. So the proceedings against a company in relation to its property cannot be begun or cannot be um, proceeded with. There's a suspension with respect to enforcement. Uh, personal guarantees cannot be enforced against a director or a relative of a director. So similar to what we see um, when we're looking at our guarantees through the um, administration process. Um, there's protections from the ipso facto clauses will apply and secured creditors cannot enforce um, in security interests except for some of the exceptions. Um, and lastly, which is again really crucial, I think for everyone in this room, if we have unperfected security interests, um, you know, whereby we haven't, uh, we've failed to register our PPS interests um, on the PPSR, they will vest with the company, like what you see in an um, administration or an external administration uh, where you haven't in, in fact taken those steps to um, perfect and register those interests. So that's really crucial um, when we're obviously dealing with all our, our customers um, and from our position as creditor to get in and obviously make our registrations. But if they aren't registered and you haven't registered, they will in fact vest in the company and um, it's a, a gift <laughs> to the company because they'll sit there with the company and um, you'll lose your rights over those, uh, those goods. So that's from a theory side. Any questions before we get into the actual meaty substance. I just wanted to ask, sure, like this. So oh, before okay. you speak, I've got to give you oh. a microphone. Yeah. It's just a, it, you may have already said it. <laughs> it is, um, it's ongoing now. This is going to be a thing. Yeah, it is, Jerry. Okay. Yeah, it's a thing. Okay. We thought we got away with it, <laughs> like we did with many things from COVID, but this is a thing. No, it's a continuing thing. So we need to be a, a, alive, I suppose, as to the impact that it can have um, on us. Um, and as I said, you know, I know Maria and Reese have um, seen a few recently um, with a lot of their customers with um, plans being put put forward or notices being given of the appointment. So it's continuing to, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say it's continuing, it's starting to flow through. I'm going to hand over to Nick, he's got anything. Thanks Anna. So um, that's pretty much the theory portion of it and I think looking at this slide, um, I don't know what you all think but not particularly creditor friendly, um, doesn't look like that there's much you can actually do when you're faced with this restructuring process and one of these types of appointments, it looks like you pretty much just got to sit there and um, and take it as the process goes through. So what I want to do is work through a practical example, a real life example that we're looking at at the moment to give you an idea of what you can actually do because the legislation itself is very restricting um, on what you can do during this period. So. This is a high level overview of the process. Um, I don't really want to go through the line by line of this because we'll work through each stage of it. Um, but probably all you need to know is that it's really split into two phases. So the first phase that you've got is the proposal phase. Um, that's 20 business days. The second phase is the acceptance, um, which is 15 business days. So. Overall, the period runs for 35 business days, so a pretty short space of time. Um, slightly longer, I think, than a standard VA, which is about 25 business days. So the idea is to pretty much get in and get out as quickly as possible with as much, um, with as little disruption to the business as possible. Um, so what does that actually look like in practice? Because talking about the theory stuff and as I've said that doesn't seem like there's a lot you can actually do um, but there are things that you can be doing along the way to improve your position or get a better understanding of what's going on with this particular customer um, particularly if you are going to continue to trade which, with them which is um, one of those things where you've got to weigh up as well um, 
a customer going through this process, how much risk do you actually place on that? So there's things that you can be doing along the way to get an understanding of that and probably put yourself in a better position to make those types of decisions at the end of it if the plan is put forward and accepted. Um, and as I said, this is a real life example. So this is a customer, a client of ours and there's just gonna be a few checkpoints along the way during the process that we'll just check back in with our client and what they've done in this particular scenario to improve their position. So um, a couple of brief facts about them, but they're a supplier of timber and related products. Um, they're owed a debt by this particular company. Um, they've got a credit agreement, it's got some terms in it. They've got a personal guarantee as well, that's got some terms in it. These things are particularly vague for a reason. Uh, so the first thing you'll see when you hear about uh, an appointment is you'll see a letter like this, um, which has a lot of words on it but doesn't actually say much. All that that is really saying is, um, I'm this particular person, I've been appointed as the restructuring practitioner to this company. Um, and then there's a lot of bold disclaimers really, which is the practitioner um, stepping back and going, I'm not the one really running the show here, it's the director still, um, you mainly need to liaise with them about the operations of the business, but I'm here to help them um, and assist them along the way. And along with that, you'll probably see some pages like this um, from a reader, which is um, the Restructuring and Turnaround um, Association, um, which again, it's a lot of words, probably doesn't mean a lot to anyone. You're probably not gonna read it. You're gonna look at it and go, that's all too much. That looks very complicated. Um, I'll just let the process go and step back and see how it all ends up at the end. So um, stepping back to our client, um, does anyone have any ideas around what they could be doing at that stage? So they've got this letter saying that there's been a restructuring practitioner appointed. What do they start looking at doing at that particular stage? Any thoughts around the room? Closing the account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, the comment there was oh, comment there was closing the account. So um, it does tie into one of the points that was on the earlier slide um, from Anna around these ipso facto type clauses, which means by the mere fact of something occurring, something else can then occur. So. Um, if an external administration or some kind of insolvency event occurs, um, because in this scenario the director's got to sign a declaration that they either are insolvent or are about to become insolvent, so it's an insolvency event under most terms and conditions. Um, so your ability to rely on a clause like that that says if the company's insolvent you can just terminate the agreement and cease supply. Um, it is certainly one of the considerations and one of the first things you should be looking at. And really that goes back to pulling out what actual agreements do you have in place with this company and understanding your rights in that scenario. So um, in this case, client's got a credit agreement. As I said, it's got some terms in it. What does it actually say? And you've got to consider whether there's any positive obligation to supply. Um, do they actually have an obligation to continue supply? or are there other terms that they can rely on to say, we don't have to continue supply in this scenario because you probably don't want to if you see one of these notices, you just go, that's risk. We're not gonna get paid this. I'm not giving away this stuff for free. So getting a really good understanding of what your contractual position is what you should be doing at the outset there. Part of that as well is looking at what are the security interests that you've got under that agreement. So you might have a look at your terms and go, oh, we've we've got a retention of title, that's great. Um, we might be secured to an extent. Um, next step is going and looking, well, did we actually register that security interest on the PPSR? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. So this is what you wanna get an idea of at the outset to go, where do we actually sit here? Um, and with your guarantee, while you can't enforce your guarantee, you still might have rights under it. So in this particular scenario, our client with a personal guarantee, it's got a charging clause in it, the director owns property, um, we were able to lodge a caveat. So that in itself, taking that step is not enforcing that guarantee. So you're able to do that without infringing um, the legislation because it's purely just um, putting a note on a title that you do have an interest in this property 
you're not taking steps to actually enforce the guarantee. You're not saying to the director, you need to pay this immediately. It's just going, we've got an interest in this property. So that's it. So that's what they did in this scenario. Um, the next thing that you'll see, 20 business days after you get that notice, um, is there's a report to credit, creditors that's issued. So your restructuring practitioner has got in there, um, they've worked with the director, had a look at the books and records or whatever books and records there might be. There might be nothing, so they might have to try and figure out from scratch what is actually going on. Um, and what you'll see in these types of reports is you'll get some background on the company. So, you know, it was incorporated in this year. These were the directors. This is the business that it runs. Um, and some performance um, pieces around that. So what have they actually been doing? How have they been tracking? Um, what ultimately led to this demise? Um, you'll get some particulars around a restructuring plan. Um, there's usually an assessment of what it looks like in the restructuring as against a liquidation. So if a liquidator was just appointed, what's the um, potential outcome there? Um, and then some considerations around whether the plan should be accepted. So the restructuring practitioner will, will say, looking at all of this, this is what you should consider um, when you actually get to the point of voting. So this is some extracts from one of these reports. Um, and I've just highlighted a few things in there that from me just skimming it, that's what I'd be probably interested in. Um, so in this case, like up the top, you've got there that they, um, they, the company ceased trading. So probably don't have any risk around having to look at whether you need to continue supply because they're not trading any further. Um, as well with that, if they're not trading any further, maybe there's some stock sitting there because they're not doing anything with it that you might be able to look at um, what your security is valued at. So that's one thing I picked up from there. Um, that next section at 3.3 is what happened to the company and I think what you see there are the same excuses that you'd be seeing with your customers who aren't paying you, um, who are saying, we've got supply issues, um, COVID. This one says lockdowns for Queensland, which um, is probably <laughs> an interesting one um, in comparison to the other states, but um, you know, rainfall as well, that's something that has been a pretty significant factor and, and is going to be going forward looking at what the uh, next few months look like. So it's good to just see, you know, kind of what they say went on there. But um, another one is that the, the business just grew too quickly. So it couldn't keep up with what it was doing. Um, and then at the bottom, so if the restructuring plan is accepted, they're not going to continue trading. So this company is basically done. They're not doing anything further. The plan itself, um, which we'll get to, is really all about getting the best return back to creditors in the scenario. Um, and we can discuss, I suppose, some of the motivations around why someone would do that. Um, this next section here just deals with what the actual plan is um, or some commentary around the plan, um, how it is actually going to be paid. And in this scenario, you've got contributions being made from an, associ an associated entity. So. What actually happened here is this company was a franchisee. They went into um, this restructuring process. There's another company then that um, has negotiated with the franchisor to take over that and continue the trading. So um, in essence, just isolating the debts to this particular company, trading on then um, with another entity and contributing funds from that trading um, as part of this plan again to try and give the highest return to creditors rather than just putting it into liquidation. So the motivations around that may be that they consider that they need to do the best thing by creditors um, to continue trading with this new entity because if he just burns everyone then you're probably just going to go we're not going to trade with you we know you know you guys all do searches when you open up new accounts and all of that you're going to look at it and go it's the same guy it's the same business why are we going to trade with you? You just burn us over here. So I'd say part of it is around saving a bit of face and doing what they can there. Um, absolute best by creditors to ensure that they can continue those relationships and make sure the same thing doesn't happen with that next business. 
Um, this then just sets out sort of the costs. So your restructuring practitioner is usually paid a portion out of the proceeds that are then paid to creditors. So in this case, I think it's a percentage of a, around 11%. Um, that's how they get paid. They're getting 16 grand for their work, um, which in the scheme of things, if you look at a VA or a liquidation, it's pretty low, uh, which is why a lot of insolvency firms don't want to take on this type of work because if you can't do it efficiently and well, you don't make money on the jobs. So that's why like a lot of your big players at the top end of town, they're not interested in this at all. Um, and there's some out there who have obviously devised a way to maybe do it efficiently or maybe take some shortcuts, um, are flogging it to, to anyone that they possibly can because they can jump in, they might see it as a, a quick cash grab for them, get in, get out and move on to the next one. Um, not naming any names or anything like that. So uh, what's also noted there, and as I said, they'll look at what the situation is as against if it went into liquidation. Um, this one, you're pretty much just looking at the bottom line. You're getting 19 cents in the dollar in the small business um, scenario. You'll probably get nothing in the liquidation scenario. And when you have a look at one of these reports, there's a lot of disclaimers as well in there by the restructuring practitioner who says, um, we're only privy to limited information. We haven't done extensive investigations like we would um, in a liquidation process. We don't necessarily know what our potential voidable transactions might be. Um, we haven't investigated those. We haven't had a good look at all of that. Um, but based on our experience and probably looking at a company of this size, their view is that in a liquidation scenario, you're probably not going to get much back because your voidable transactions might be limited to something like an insolvent trading claim, which is expensive to run. Um, the director themselves might not actually have anything to pay the company back if the, um, the liquidators run that type of a claim. There might be related party type transactions, there might be unfair preferences. Um, these are the things a liquidator can pursue. Um, but they've pretty much just said, you know, in our experience, we don't think you'll probably get a dividend at the end of it. And probably most of you in here could count on one hand how many dividends you've received in a liquidation. Um, there certainly wouldn't be many, I would say. So that's what the report looks like. And as I said, like, that's what I would do when I'm looking at one of these, just go through, highlight things of interest, um, because then that forms sort of what you can do as a next step, um, which we'll touch on in a sec, but um, the second half of that report is the actual restructuring plan. And this is what one of those looks like. It's very short. It's not a lot really in there. You get an idea of um, how much is being contributed. So that's in that item eight. That's probably what most people are interested in, in looking at. They just want to know how much money is going to be in the pot and how much of it are we actually going to get. Um, and the, the probably the, the term as well. So this one's over a period of three years. There's a lot of other uh, mandatory items that go with the report. So there's a proposal statement that sets out the schedule of debts. So uh, it'll list out every single um, debt that is likely going to be captured by this um, process. So what is an admissible claim? It sets out all of those. Um, it sets out the standard terms. So the terms are prescribed by the legislation, um, which pretty much says things like all the claims rank equally. They're paid out in the same proportion. So you get like a cents in the dollar for each dollar that you're owed. Um, but that's all just standard. But yeah, looking at the plan itself, it's pretty underwhelming. You're not really getting much from that. So coming back again at this particular stage, um, what do you think we could be looking at or our client could be looking at at this stage in the process um, to better their position? Any thoughts around the room?
Yeah? Who determines the path in which the company takes, whether it goes to administration or it goes into restructuring? Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who determines the path in which the company takes, whether it either goes into administration <clears throat> or this type or, of a or process. into restructuring? And the second question is, what are the differences between this and also the uh, uh, scheme of company arrangement? Yep. Um, so with the first question, in practice, likely what you'll have is the director will go to an insolvency practitioner or maybe get some pre-insolvency advice is probably where that's going to come in. So they'll go and see someone who professes to be an expert in insolvency but has no qualifications and they might say to them, this is a better option for you. Um, or if they go to a registered liquidator, they'll assess it and the difference here is so the, the li if it's a registered liquidator and they go into this restructuring process, the liquidator at the end or the restructuring practitioner at the end of it needs to basically sign off on it um, and say that they can actually comply with this plan but the whole way through the process the liquidator or the restructuring practitioner has the um, has the obligation to assess whether this is actually appropriate for the company so if they decide at a particular point in time that this process is no longer appropriate for the company or the company would be better off in liquidation, they can terminate it. So it's largely just to do with the advice that they get. Um, and a liquidator is, or someone who is qualified as a liquidator is only going to recommend this process over a liquidation if they think it's the best way forward. So same as kind of anything we really do, like you know, when you guys come to us for advice, we consider a particular path is better than another. So you're relying on um, a lot of the time expert advice. And then in terms of the, the second question, the difference or the main difference is from any of those other um, traditional types of external administration. So your liquidation, your voluntary administration, your receivership. Um, the key difference is that the director remains in control. So when you have any sort of um, external administration, that insolvency practitioner steps in and they take over. They take it out of the director's hands, they lose all of their power. But under this restructuring process, the director retains all of their power. So that's the key difference. It's trying to allow them, um, I suppose, the ability to captain their own ship and, and direct it in a way that they see fit. So I guess a lot of a lot of it would be to do with the level of insolvency or solvency of the company, wouldn't yeah. it? Just really that, how that, that the uh, insolvency practitioner determines. Yeah. Once he's completed his investigation. That's it. It's just really how dire it is, and you could probably think of this process as like a mini voluntary administration and deed of company arrangement, um, where in one scenario, like your VA docker your IP takes over that and they take control, but in this scenario with your process and plan, the director stays in control. So you've got to assess what is actually the best way forward for the company. Um, and pretty much in all of these, the main consideration is what is likely going to achieve the best return for creditors. So that's what is always um, on the mind of the insolvency practitioner is, is this the most appropriate way forward to um, represent the interests of creditors? Because that's what they're there to do. That's their principal duty. Yeah. How, um, <laughs> how does ASIC, ASIC um, deal with the directors who are going under that process? Are they still able to be directors of other entities while they're under, while they're going under that? Um, yeah. They are? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so there's no sort of automatic disqualification or anything like that. Um, if they go bankrupt, they're autom automatically disqualified, but just because you've been a director of a company that goes into some form of administration doesn't automatically ban you from being a director. If you do it a few times, um, you get into a position where ASIC will look to, to ban you from managing a corporation. Um, but that goes back to... Uh, if you have someone who has repeated fail failures um, or uses this process, they can't do it again. 
within seven years. So that's trying to safeguard someone from just abusing this process and using it over and over again to probably Phoenix companies and start them up again. Um, and likely with um, like direct identification numbers coming in, that might help with that sort of a situation, is keeping track of um, what actually is going on and how many corporations a director is involved in because they've got different names out there. So um, we'll see what sort of happens with all of that when that really kicks into full gear. That was my other question too about the ID. Yeah. Um, so in terms of where our client is at this stage in the process and what they could potentially be doing is you can look at engaging with the restructuring practitioner to request information um, if you're particularly interested in you know sort of the underlying information behind the report you can make a request to the small business restructuring practitioner and go well, can you give us some more information on this so we can consider that um, you can dispute your debt if you look at the schedule and go, that doesn't look right, that's not how much we're owed. They've said um, there's 10 grand in there, but we're actually owed 100. Um, and then obviously the, you get to the point of voting on the plan, but there's also other things that you can be doing outside of the actual process. So as I said, um, what our client had done is they'd already lodged a caveat uh, and what they were doing on the side was just speaking to the director and saying to them, really, at the end of all of this, you're either going to get a plan up or you don't. Either way it goes, you're still going to be personally liable for this. So we're just waiting for this process to end and then we're going after you. So that again, not enforcing your guarantee. You're not going off and suing them. You're not saying to them, you've got to pay everything now. But it's just having a conversation and saying, at the end of all of this, you're still going to be up for it. So let's have a conversation now and try and work out an arrangement whereby you know, you pick up the shortfall. Um, if, if it's 19 cents in the dollar, you pay 81. You pay it over a period or something like that. And again, like if the motivation behind this is to keep the creditors happy because maybe they'll keep trading with you, it makes sense for the director then to have those discussions with you because otherwise the alternative for them is maybe go bankrupt and then everything falls over. So they're going to do whatever they can and the fact that they've engaged in this process suggests that they're doing whatever they can to keep this thing going so they're going to keep engaging with you and if you can do it um, from the perspective of it's still friendly we're not suing you or anything like that uh, you can probably negotiate a better deal it seems like a bit of a, a comfort for somebody to enter into this because we won't <coughs> sue them hopefully oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> But isn't it a bit, a bit of a comfort for them to just take this option and it, then we've got to wear it if we say yes? I don't, I mean, it, if they're going to pay over three years, I don't think we'd be agreeing to it. Yeah, well, it is. Um, <laughs> but I think you've got to remember as well how they got to that point. So they're in pretty significant financial distress. They're looking for a way out and maybe the easy option was just to chuck it into liquidation. So you get nothing then. Um, and then maybe you pursue them under a personal guarantee. Maybe they go bankrupt and you get nothing that, that way as well. So uh, while I think it is um, a way out for them, you've got to keep in mind that they're looking to do something to actually improve the position yeah. of creditors. And yeah, you're pretty hamstrung. You can't do anything from a legal perspective during the process, um, which is why you've got to look for options that might actually result in a return for you other than just them sinking companies all sinking, yep. bankruptcy, and nothing. Nick, does an SBR absolve a director of their responsibilities in relation to director's penalty notices? Uh, this is why we think there's probably going to be an increase or there likely is an uptick of these. So um, depending on the type of director penalty notice, so um, if anyone's ever heard of them, you can have a lockdown or non-lockdown one. Um, if they're served with a non-lockdown director penalty notice, they have the option of appointing a restructuring practitioner similar to they had the option of um, appointing a voluntary administrator or... So in that event, this process would absolve them? They're not, yeah, they're, they're not on the hook then kind of immediately for yeah. it. So that's why I think with the ATO issuing... 
a lot of director penalty notices. We're probably going to see more um, using this process if they do qualify, because it may be a cheaper option as well than um, appointing like a liquidator in terms of their upfront costs. So they might not have the cash to, because with some liquidators you, you need to put money in account for them, so they've actually got something to pay their fees. Um, so more might look at this type of process and you know, with those numbers, I can't say that that was the reason why we've seen so many in the last three months, but it's possibly contributed to it is that um, directors are, are looking to avoid that liability um, under a non-lockdown DPN by appointing one of these restructuring practitioners. Wayne? Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions is to, um, uh, we did see a spate of these restructuring um, um, listings come up recently and then they've sort of died off again um, but you've already answered that question but Mike I know it's a relatively new regime are there any statistics around at the moment that would uh, show just whether these things are actually being successful uh, I, I don't know the answer to that um, we've seen or you would have seen from the numbers that about 50% of the actual appointments are resulting in plans I don't know the stats around termination of plans and it may be too early to actually assess what that looks like, but um, similar to a docker as well, you don't see every docker succeed just because it's voted up. Um, they're quite often terminated. So um, I'll get to as well, like how these can potentially end once the plan is voted in. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it's possible that um, that you, you do see a lot of them fail, but what they have as well and what the restructuring practitioner has to sign off on is do they consider that the company has the ability to comply with the terms of the restructuring plan? Um, and I don't think a lot of them are going to take that lightly. They're not just going to say, yeah, I reckon it's going to be all right, um, and they'll sign off on it because it's their professional reputation. So I, I'd say that most who are doing it would take their professional obli obligations pretty seriously and only sign off plans that they genuinely believe um, are going to be um, successful. Um, this is just a point on the types of information you, requests you can make. So uh, there's, uh, as part of the insolvency rules, you can make a request of a restructuring practitioner. Um, they've got, I think it's five days or something like that to respond to you if they don't consider that the request is reasonable, which are these reasons here. Um, they can knock back your request. So it's an opportunity to ask for information that you might be interested in if you're going to continue trading with them, if that is an option um, at the end of it. Um, <coughs> the ATO is very um, involved in these types of processes because they're usually the major creditor and usually have the swing vote as to whether these things actually get up. So from speaking to some practitioners around these types of information requests, they do have pretty extensive requests from the ATO, and the ATO is basically saying to them, you sell to us why this thing is actually going to work, you tell us the story, um, and back it up by the data as to why this thing's going to work, and if everything matches up, then um, they usually then vote for it. So they've been voting for, if it hits about 20 cents in the dollar, that's their sort of threshold. Um, but you know, this whether you make these types of requests is probably contingent on how savvy you are, how much time you've got, um, and how much skin you've actually got in the game. If you're one percent of the creditor pool, you're not going to spend all this time going, making all these requests, and going through all this data. Um, if ultimately you're probably going to have no impact on the actual vote, so it's just balancing that as well. But if you're a major creditor, you might be interested in actually engaging with the practitioner and seeing what you can get out of them um, because your vote then can potentially determine whether the plan gets up or not. And just a note on disputing the schedule of debt. So if you look at the schedule again and go, that doesn't look right, um, where I double what the schedule says, you've got five business days to um, write to the uh, practitioner and say you've got it wrong. They've then got to come back to you. Um, they make an uh, assessment. They can request information from you. They can request it from the director and they decide whether um, ultimately you're right or, or wrong about what your 
what you say you're owed. If you're aggrieved by that, you can go and apply to the court um, for a determination on it. it. It may not be particularly cost effective to do that, depending on how much you're owed and what the actual difference may be if you're looking at, you know, we said that we were owed um, 50 grand instead of 40 grand, um, gauge that against the dollars or the, the cents per dollar that you might get by getting that extra 10 grand on as against the legal cost that you'll spend contesting it, it may not be worth doing that. You might just go, yeah, we'll, we'll say we're 40, that's fine. It's gonna be a couple of thousand dollars difference between what we might get paid under it. So um, being commercial and making decisions about that sort of a thing, um, instead of just going, we're right and we need to prove that. Um, so how does it all end? There's a few ways that it can go. As I mentioned before, the practitioner's got an obligation the whole way through to make an assessment as to whether um, this is actually appropriate or not. And if the company no longer meets the criteria, they can just go, no, nah, it's done. Um, if the plan's approved, your uh, restructuring practitioner is then appointed um, to basically monitor the plan. So they'll make payments um, on behalf of the company, they'll manage the admin side of the plan, but they're not involved in running the company at all again. It's all the directors who are in charge of that. So they're just there to make sure what the company said that they'd be doing under the plan actually gets done. Um, the court uh, can order a termination if someone applies. So if you're particularly aggrieved by um, the vote, you can apply to the court to have it set aside. So. There might be limited circumstances where that might actually occur and that breakup of um, creditors to affected and excluded might alleviate the situations that you can see in a voluntary administration process where you've got related party, parties who pile on all the votes for a docker um, that doesn't suit any of their interests and is against the creditors' interests. Um, in this scenario, related creditors' votes don't count. So they can't use the vote to um, advance their own interests as against the interests of creditors. Uh, you can also have the plan being conditionally approved. So you might have a situation where um, it's subject to the director obtaining some finance to make a contribution. And if they don't do that within the time period, which is 10 business days, the plan can just terminate. Um, or the plan can be rejected. And if it's rejected, uh, it just goes back to uh, the company just goes or stays with the director. It doesn't go into um, liquidation automatically. It doesn't go into voluntary administration automatically. It just goes back to the director. They can decide what they do. Um, but in circumstances where they've signed a declaration that says they're insolvent or likely to become insolvent, they're probably then going to step up and um, use one of the traditional external administration processes. Um, so that's how it can end. How it's accepted um, is pretty simple. This is what a form looks like. So you go in, fill out your details, put in what you're voting for, um, but it's just majority. So as I said, like the ATO is usually the one who's calling the shots on it. I think in this scenario, they're owed like 200 grand um, in comparison to the next major creditor, which is about 60 odd. So they're at the end of the day, probably gonna be the one who's making the call on a lot of these, which is um, why I've said, you know, you want to be looking at what you can be doing that's outside of the process to improve your position if you can't take any action from a legal perspective and you can't actually influence the vote on the plan. And then, so what happens if it's accepted? Um, you're, if you're an unsecured creditor, you're bound by it. You can't just say, I didn't vote for that, so that doesn't apply to me. Um, so you're bound by it and your debt's gonna be discharged provided they actually go all the way through and complete their obligations on it. So you cop in this scenario, your 90 cents or 19 cents in the dollar, that's all you get, um, unless you've got other avenues available to pursue um, action. Um, you can't commence a wind up. Uh, your unsecured, security, uh, unperfected security interests that have already vested, vest again, they're gone, they're already gone. Um, but then you can start to enforce your personal guarantees, which is why we say, if you're able to have conversations earlier, um, you're not then just starting at square one when 
this plan is either voted in, um, if you don't have to wait that 35 business days to actually start setting yourself up to uh, reduce your exposure, but you can start taking legal action then against um, the directors and um, your security can also be enforced as well um, to the extent that it doesn't relate to an admissible debt. So let's say a scenario where um, you've got security, it's registered, um, there's maybe 30 grand's worth of product on site, you're owed 60, um, you, you've got 30 grand there that's secured, the other 30 um, is unsecured, so then you can't enforce any security as against that unsecured portion, but you can enforce as against the balance and make that recovery that way as well, but you just can't do anything while it's going through the process. So again, checking back in with our client. So I think the voting on this one closes today, so we'll see what actually happens on it. Um, but as I said, they're negotiating with the guarantor to um, make up a shortfall. They've taken steps to put them in a better position than if they were just to accept the plan, cop their 19 cents and move on. Um, they're hopefully able to get a much better return um, than if they were just to, to do nothing. Um, so summary and takeaways. We're likely to see a lot more of this. Um, we've seen a lot more in the last three months. Whether that trend continues, I've got no idea. Can't predict the future, but it likely is going to. Um, we're probably going to see more um, businesses using this um, as everyone becomes more familiar with the process. Um, it all sort of begins at the very start of your relationship with your customer to be in the strongest position to make a recovery at the end of this. Um, once the restructuring practitioner is appointed, it's all pretty late in the piece. There's not a lot you can do at that stage, but um, if you've got like effective agreements in place that have rights, um, that have security under them, you know, you've got your registrations done. Um, if there's a charge in there as well over real property, you might have um, the ability to lodge caveats, um, particularly in guarantees as well, so you can look at going after the directors that way. Um, but that all starts at the very beginning and you've got to get those things right from the start and um, if you do that, you can really improve your position uh, when you get to the, the pointy end of this process. Always review your position as well. It's not just a set and forget. You might have done these things when your account had like a 10 grand limit and now they're trading on 500. So it doesn't make sense to just go, we got it, we did these things at the start, so they're gonna be all sweet um, all the way up until the end. Just continue to review um, your contractual and your security position to make sure that the circumstances match up with what you're actually trading um, with your, on your customer. So actively engage in the process to get a better understanding of the proposal. As I said, this is not always going to be the best way to deal with it. If you don't have that much um, skin in the game, you're not owed that much, you might just go, well, I'm not going to spend all this time dealing with the practitioner. We'll just see what happens on it. But if you've got other avenues available, um, you might look to direct your energy that way. Um, but if you're a major creditor, it might make sense for you to get really involved in it and speak with the practitioner and get information from them that can um, properly inform you to make a decision. And just take any steps that you can outside the process. So as I said, with this particular scenario, like we'd lodged a caveat, uh, we'd been dealing with the guarantor to try and set up a, an arrangement whereby at the end of all of this, when this uh, when the dust settles on whatever happens, if the plan goes um, up or down, they're in the best possible position to still make a recovery um, close to, you know, 100 cents in the dollar. So do whatever you can outside the process if there are things you can do. But again, that all stems back to whatever you do at the, the very start of the relationship. And that's it. We're pretty close to time, but I think we've got time for questions if there are any. Nothing on there? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to find out from um, an aspect of actually processing a credit application form, um, is there any kind of disclosure or anything um, that you would be aware of uh, if they're already in this, um, you know, 
period. Um, say, for instance, say two to three months already in. Yeah, it should. And then they come to you with a credit application as a new supplier. Yeah, it, you should be able to pick it up on mm-hmm. your searches. Like if you're just doing, like any time you open an account, you do some due, due diligence, do some ASIC searches, similar to... You'll certainly see it on our screen. Yeah. Wow. Um, similar to like where you'll see a company name, administrators appointed, you'll see like company name, um, restructuring plan or something like that. I don't know what the actual designation is, but I'm pretty sure that there is one. But if you just... Restructuring, practitioner. appointed, that's it. Yep. So yeah, you should see that when you're doing your searches if you're opening an account. Any other questions? All good. Thanks very much, guys. Um, We've got a feedback as well. I'll leave that one up, but um, as I said, or Anna said at the start, if you want copies of the slides or there's a few other things um, in terms of information that you can get from us, um, please use the the feedback there um, and send us through anything that you you need a hand with. Um, My details and Anna's details are on the slide as well. All good. Thanks, guys. Thank you.